Hi everybody, Greg Diamico here, and I am part of the Accelerators Organization Mentoring Group, and here to do a mentoring session for you. A little bit of history, I've done a previous one, but for anybody new to the group, I, am, I have a software company. I do mobile app and e-commerce and integration development. I went to India back in 2004, I set up an office over there, and have grown a team out of up to 50 people and now I've leaned it out a little bit over the last few years and we do a lot of work with existing businesses helping them grow and provide economics and, and simplicity within their business using software so growth opportunities like yeah, scaling with e-commerce and being online and selling to creating cost-effective type situations where they are integrating things making systems talk to each other so they don't duplicate a lot of entry minimizing cost and and also having access to data that they didn't have before so that they can see real-time metrics in their business and and having uh, intel that's going to make them allow them to make better decisions so also previously i had an investment firm i uh, grew a successful firm uh, from zero up to a billion dollars in assets over a period of time and and uh, rode the wave up in the 90s it kind of rode a, back down a little bit in the early 2000s and but I ended up selling that and when I was in that world I realized that uh, seeing where the future was going was connectivity through software and I wanted a I wanted to have an investment firm and through a partner I came together with with her and April and she uh, was in that space before so knew how to go out and sell software and have a lot of relationships in that space and we went to uh, we went to India and set up an office and created a development team there and still have that today so uh, good to be here with you guys uh, uh, Sean Thomas and I are our friends we are also in the entrepreneurs organization together EO and we're also in the same form. So we spend time together helping each other with our businesses to uh, EOs about peer peer to peer group network that you are there to learn and grow with each other. What you basically what you guys are doing here within this organization. So uh, good to be here. I've uh, I've done some work with a few people in the organization. One, Shelly Morell. You may know Shelly. She's got a company called Integrated uh, Fire in, in uh, California that does like the monitoring of, of uh, fire equipment and reporting around those issues that that are highly regulated you got to provide reports to the state and help her build an app that allows for integration into uh, seeing visibility around her people where they are what's going on with the uh, being out on, on the field when they're going out what type of jobs they're in so important for that type of uh, world of helping people with Intel and, and seeing where they are so with that let's get into a few questions here uh, don't have a lot but we'll do what we can to share and kind of got some interesting different type of questions given my my uh, experience but we'll do what we can to to share from our experiences so first question is from um, Edwin Edwin duress I think you say his name Edwin asked uh, hi my name is Edwin and I I want to ask how you deal with cash flow issues in a business I've been growing an e-commerce wholesaling business via selling on Amazon I've been increasing my inventory and it's been resulting in additional sales I have approximately 60,000 inventory at the moment with approximately 60,000 in sales with a 20% margin. An issue I'm having is I've been borrowing money from my main businesses, which are five retail checking, check cashing facilities. But now that I've borrowed a lot of cash from the business, my main business is a bit short on cash that I need to effectively run the business. My question is what suggestions do you have for me as, for, as, as far as solving cash flow issues in my business now and also long term have you ever had cash flow issues in your business and what do you do to solve them so uh, good question here Edwin and it's an important one because what a lot of people don't know is that you can actually grow yourself out of business okay I learned that a long time ago not by experience thankfully but by seeing how when companies grow really fast they need cash and resources to manage that growth 
and a lot of times they don't have it and they can grow themselves right out of business. So what you're dealing with here is, is common in that space. So let's talk around it. I don't have the direct experience of having a lot of inventory. My company investment firm and a software company, I don't have the inventory situation. I've recently brought on a couple of businesses that I've partnered with that I have a little bit of inventory management, but that's just getting started and I don't really have any strong experience to share, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll share with you from knowledge and what I've witnessed in, in the business world and being with an EO for 20 years and so forth. So what, um, what I would say is that what kind of inventory do you have and why do you have inventory? Okay. I mean, you're talking about you have inventory, but it's really important to think about inventory in the sense of given that you didn't explain as much, your situation may be that you have to have inventory, but is it possible to not have, is it possible to drop ship? A lot of people that are selling on Amazon are actually getting orders and they're placing their order directly to the manufacturer and having the manufacturer ship it directly to the customer. So my first um, question to you would be, is that a possibility? Is there some way that you can manage that situation and make that happen? Um, make it make it happen so you can minimize the amount of inventory that you have. You said you have a 20% margin. That's a pretty decent margin in retail sales. So what are your opportunities to increase your margin so you can spread out the amount of cash that you have available and um, different things that you can do there need to know more information about what you're doing to figure out the margin situation uh, the other thing is what access other accesses do you have to cash a lot, a lot of times to grow you need money right so you're taking it from your other businesses what's the opportunity to borrow from the bank can you borrow at the bank at four or five six percent and able to allow your growth to pay for it given the margins that you have. Um, that's the way a lot of people manage that situation. They get a line of credit and they use that line of credit to manage, manage their growth process. The other thing I would think about is to, uh, in looking at this, is to think about it from the uh, Jim Collins, one of his books, he talked about the 20 mile march and i've read all his books and I'm, I'm not pinpointing which one it was in but in the 20 mile march it was a, a term that he coined in the fact that he did a lot of research about people being steady and doing things on a consistent basis and managing their, their situation as opposed to just trying to go all out as much as possible and run into trouble and the story he told was around uh, the exp uh, an exploration that happened in the Antarctic in the early 1900s and two groups were trying to reach to the end of the earth basically uh, uh, in the South Pole and what they did was was they were both on a race to get there and one group was the leader of the group approached it so that they only did 20 miles every day okay and whether, whether it was was blizzard whether it was really cold whether it was clear skies they did 20 miles and they set that tempo and that rhythm to move forward with their their uh, their team the other one did it in a sense of just all out it was clear days go 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 do get 40 miles in get 50 miles in and then on the blizzards and cold they would they would hunker down and set up uh, uh, camp and and just uh, ride it out and what they found what Jim Collins found in his research was by the way, he's one of my favorite business gurus. So if you haven't read Good to Great or some of his other books, I would highly recommend that. Uh, very, very strong awareness about how to run a business and how to uh, the key aspects of what successful businesses do. So uh, what he found in his research was that the companies that, that kept a consistent tempo and allowed and managed things, even when they could grow more than, than they um, – uh, that was available, customers were there for them, they set limitations and managed it so they were dealing with their resources, they were dealing with their cash flow and allowing for themselves to not go out of business basically and have and still provide good uh, growth opportunities going forward. So look forward to um, hearing any thoughts you have Edwin or any other questions you would have, I'd, I'd, uh, I'll check back with it and see if there's anything I can help you with. Next question is from Gabor. Gabor uh, 
Grazy, I think I'm saying it right. And uh, sorry, Gabor, if I'm not, I know there's different ways to accent that name. Hope I'm saying yours appropriately. So, Gabor asks, we've been approached by an investor who seems serious about acquiring 50% of our company. This is not a proposal for an investment into the company. It's him proposing to pay my two co-owners and I for 50% equity. What are the important questions to ask in a situation like this, apart from, of course, how much the payment would be? I'm thinking along the lines of how much operational control they would want to have, what kind of plans they have for the company once they're a co-owner, how can they contribute to growing the company, what are the key issues we need to agree on apart from the money if we want this deal to happen. So first question for you, Gabor, is why do you want this to happen? Do you Are you in a situation where a buyout of your equity right now is going to put you in um, an attractive financial situation? Are you in need of capital that this investor is going to bring to you so that you can grow the, the operations uh, more attractively, more efficiently, and, and so forth? So um, I would be the questions you asked on here uh, are very appropriate, and all this would be mapped out in the situation before you did a deal, of course, right? Like, why are they wanting to invest, and are they going to be a strategic investor? When I say strategic, what I'm saying is, uh, with their help into the company, are they going to provide your company an opportunity to grow faster because they have a marketplace that your products can sell into, and they would allow the acceleration of sales for you. Uh, and so maybe they see that as like they have a grouping of products that are already being sold to a, a significant clientele. If they add your products to that clientele, it's an offering that's going to make everybody happy because you're going to get significant sales and so are they. So there's questions, is, is, he, is he just doing it from an investment? He sees your, what you're doing as attractive and you're not giving me a lot of intel about your situation so it's a little bit harder so I'm just going to propose questions for you to ask. Is he looking at you and is seeing that you're growing well and so he wants to jump on that bandwagon and ride with you as you grow out the company? And uh, it, on top of that, just like you asked, does he want to be an investor in the sense of um, jumping on and riding and supporting you? Does he have business acumen that's going to help you with the future decisions and, and ongoing uh, ongoing operational aspects of the company and strategic direction of the company. So those are very uh, key things. Something else I would consider is valuations, okay? Valuations are key here to, uh, and usually the big question to answer when it comes to somebody putting money in your company. And evaluation can be, uh, or, or looked at a couple different ways. They're looked at as either some type of percent of revenue or a percent of a percentage, a multiple of your EBITDA, okay, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation. And coming from the investment world, that's how you analyze the cash flows of a company currently coming in and then some multiple of those cash flows that are going to create a valuation. So a, a lot of companies, you'll be somewhere between uh, three to four to uh, 10, 11, 12, times their evidence and some a lot of times with um, revenue it could be one times the revenue of the company if it's a single person or a, a consulting type business that if with that company or with that person in the business they're going to be making the money if they're not in the business then there's questions about the revenue or some type of scalable situation. A lot of times software companies that have reoccurring revenue can, can sell for 2.5 to five times revenue and sometimes even more than that. So you look at the industry trends of what that particular industry is selling at, try to get intel in the, and research to align yourself with what your world is selling for and the particular type of products you offer and to help yourself give the right valuation. Uh, Oh, let's see. Uh, the other things to think about are voting stock. A lot, of, something very important here is that if you get they come in as a fifty percent investor, what's going to happen with decisions going forward? And uh, you have, from what it sounds like, you have two other partners in the business, and with the three of you owning fifty percent and that person owning fifty, they would only have to get one other person on their side 
to have have uh, decisional con or control over the decisions that would take place going forward. So if you go, if the three of you are not of alignment, one of those three could go to the 50% owner and get the direction of company to move in, in the way they want it to. So um, do you want a 50% investment? Okay, or take something less than a 50% investment. Do, can, if they do 50% investment, can the voting, would they allow the voting rights to be differently? That you still maintain a 51 or 55% voting that you and your partners, and they have a 50% return opportunity, but the voting stock could be different. So that's something to explore. I've done that with myself, where I've, I've um, helped build software for a company that I took investment in, and it was, uh, it was they had the, the idea and the uh, subject matter expertise and so forth, and I ended up um, getting 40% uh, of the company, but I had 50% of the voting rights, so that it can be turned both ways. So that's something else to, to uh, consider. Um, so, you know, what are, what are, is there any other expertise that they have and they could bring to the company, of course, that would help you, you know, in, in the growth of your company? Do they have expertise in the products that you're offering? How did they come about you? How did they know about your situation? Why did they want to invest? So a lot of those questions could be, uh, could be looked at in determining if this situation is going to be right for you and what your needs are. So a lot more to be determined, but hopefully some, some of those questions and discussions with this individual will unfold answers um, to you so you can help make the best decision possible. Good luck with that, Gabor. Next question. Carrie, Carrie uh, Bowen, I think, and Carrie's uh, question is, I'm a healthy female, I exercise daily, eat fairly clean diet, uh, geared for optimal brain and body function, I know the right things to do to be healthy, however, I'm undergoing surgery, uh, hysterectomy, in a few weeks, which will make me feel even better, uh, I know, I'm looking at the surgery as a reset button for my health, in my sense, since I've been thrown off track the past few months due to the inability to eat what and how I normally would. And uh, given that there's some issues there, that she's having nausea and such, what recommendations do you have post-op that will facilitate healing and restart my body on the most effective path for the new year? I want to heal quickly and come out of the starting gate smooth, smoothly, ready to run. Thank you for taking the time to answer the question. Well, Carrie, uh, first of all, I am not a health practitioner. I'm not a doctor, and I don't even play one on TV. So with that said, I have a long history of, of reading and growing in the space of health and trying to stay as physically fit and, and um, geared towards health as possible. So I'll have a little bit of experience share for you. I, had a, I was big into martial arts. Um, some time back, and I had a to torn shoulder, um, rotator cuff, and a, and a bicep tendon tear, and it put me out of commission. Uh, I actually was was injured and continued to train and work out for five years after my injury with lots of pain, and, and I did a lot of things to try to deal with the pain, thinking it was going to heal itself, and it never, it didn't, and it wasn't until my bicep tendon tore that I ended up getting um, I ended up getting surgery on the shoulder and repairing the bicep tendon and everything else. So my experience with surgery and, and health in general is I used a lot of things to, to help me heal, making sure my body was energy with flow was appropriate. So I used acupuncture. And that has been tremendously helpful in a lot of areas. I used massage when the, sh the shoulder was uh, healing up. And I wasn't supposed to move it that much, but um, I would have somebody massage it regularly and create blood flow and, and help healing. That was that was huge because when I went to physical therapy, the uh, my range of motion that I had each time I went back, she said I was she didn't see anybody like the the range of motion at those different points in time. So I knew I was doing things that were helping me to be a little bit. Um, uh, were beneficial and a little bit ahead of the normal curve of somebody's healing progress. So I, I felt good about those stuff, that those things. And the other, an, another area that that is attractive for healing is being peaceful, getting rid of the stress in your life and so forth. And when I've 
Um, anytime that I have been and work to be peaceful, I know that it helps my decision making and helps for my healing. So I, I do uh, breathing exercises every morning and um, uh, do kind of like an insightfulness uh, sitting outside and looking at the view and, 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 and going within to help with my world and help to uh, help to create a good flow and a good positive environment. So breathing exercises are as simple as like um, picking a number that you're comfortable with, you know, five to 10 or whatever, and, and taking a breath into that number, holding it to that number and exhaling to that number and doing that like five to seven times. And that will just, you'll notice just a peacefulness that comes over you. So again, just breathing into that number, counting in your head to say it's five, holding it to five, and then exhaling it to five, and just counting that number in your head. And you'll, 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 after you do that five to seven times, and you just sit there peacefully, you will notice a, a calmness that overcomes your body. So that would be uh, something that I would start uh, getting out and doing walks. It's, we are, our bodies are energy sources, and we have a positive and negative, just like you find in any battery that you pull out and put in any type of device that you have. And they have that positive end and that negative end. And a lot of times, the energy buildup in our bodies can happen. And if we try, when, when we do things like getting rid of that um, excess energy through the negative side of things, and that is walking walking on, on grass. If, if weather permitting in your area, if you can get outside, walk on grass, walk on sand, walk so that your body is connected to the earth you can help alleviate inflammation in the body and create uh, the opportunity to heal quicker. So there's also, if you don't have those abilities, there's things called earthing mats that if you do a little research on the internet, you can find out about an earthing mat that helps ground you and, and will help to uh, eliminate inflammation also. Good luck with your surgery, Carrie, and, and all the best, and, and please report back on, on your progress. So being a software guy, it's, it's a different type of question is normal, but hopefully some experience will help there. So next question is from Jason. Jason uh, Antonio. Jason asked the question, how can I make the most of a business expo event as a solo entrepreneur? What are the ideas of how to best network at events? So... Jason, I've been to a lot of events and a lot of a lot of uh, uh, a lot of EO events, a lot of uh, business-related events, especially when I was back in the investment world. I went to a lot of conferences, and I actually exhibited at conferences. I've attended conferences. I've networked at conferences. So a little bit of experience for you in that space. You didn't say whether you were just attending. Um, you said, how can I make the most of a business expo? So are you attending, or are you exhibiting, or both? And that's uh, that's the first question. So if you are exhibiting or on the at the event, then what can you do to attract people to come to you? A lot of times um, I've used, you know, people over time have, have done things to create what, how do you get people to come over and say hi and talk to you? And that's kind of your background, um, putting the right right um, need out there, okay? Your, your website and everything else you put out should represent the right need that you are feeling. So displaying the need that you are feeling so that people would be attracted to you. Hey, I have that need. That resonates with me. I'm going to talk to that person and get people over there. So a couple of the, you know, the other nuances that I've seen over time, and of course, a lot of people will put attractive people at, in their booth. So whether they are working for the company or they go hire attractive people, man or woman, to be there so that they can talk to them. And, and that's, that's uh, something that can be expensive and, and costly, but it's something that people do to get, <laughs> to get people over there. Something as simple as, and I've done this one, is uh, put out Reese cups. That orange little packet has some type of it sets off some type of thing in our brains it does it for me personally i think that's probably why i picked it but i see that orange little wrapper uh and and reese cup and i put a big pile of them out in front uh people would come over and you know start grabbing open up and say oh so what do you do here what's going on 
and that's been been helpful for me. In fact, I remember one time in a conference years ago, some guy had walked by multiple times, kind of, and at one point he just walks over. You know, I keep walking by your booth. I keep seeing those Reese's, and I just got to eat one. Can I just grab one? I'm like, yeah, sure, take it. So it's whatever you can to get people there, but it's also the presentation about selling yourself and providing that need is most important. So if you are attending the conference and you want to network, I would. Um, I what I've done in the past in my experience has been do the research on the people that are there okay who's there that you would want to talk to if you had the ultimate uh, connection of somebody that you would buy your product or you could make your product better by talking to this person or you could get uh, network to another industry or somebody that would help you help your business in some way who are they out there? Figure them out, look at their pictures, and then seek them out, and and have that right, you know, approach of what you're trying to accomplish, and politely uh, make that make your intro and tell them what you're looking for. And people are receptive uh, when it can help them, and so forth. They are open, and people go to these things to network too, and everybody's kind of shy, and like I don't know if they want to talk to me. I don't know if I want to talk to them. I've been there. In the EO groups, it's just really easy because everybody's there to, they know it's, it's they're not really going to be sold in anything, so it makes it a little bit more comfortable, but everybody's there to learn and grow and, and meeting people and talking about their businesses or is you go from zero to 100 really fast. So uh, let's see. Um, what else? Oh, the other thing would be a lot of these new conferences, networking events, uh, or uh, expo type convention events, they have a mobile app now. Okay, utilize that mobile app. That mobile app has the opportunity to put out questions and connect to the right people. There's usually like a, some type of program in there that you can uh, tell what you're looking for and people, well, you'll, you'll get a list of people that represent that particular interest. So look up the people that are there, look, use the mobile app, uh, take advantage of some research and some legwork beforehand. That'll get you a long way and uh, move you a lot further ahead. What I didn't used to do years ago and I do now is I start looking at the list of people because I'll run into people that I've met before and I usually have a good memory about where people's locations are, where they're from, and what their business is, but not remembering their names. So this is, um, uh, I would look through the list of the two, three, four, five hundred 500 people that would be at a conference and look them up so I can remember their names, so I can uh, uh, say hi and, and be friendly and, and so forth relative to that. But more of an expo like you're talking about, it's really getting to know people and putting yourself out there to, to find what you're looking for and what can benefit your situation. And that's really based on a lot of research and utilizing the technology that, that people have today. So good luck with that, Jason. Please report back and share your, uh, your experience with what happened there. And the last question I have right now is from Robin, Robin Turpin. Robin asks, do you ever take a step back to regroup? So, Yes, we're having all the time. Um, I have over the years been in tough situations with business and tough situations with people. As we all have, what we learn over time with business, most of you probably have experienced that is business is about people. It's about the people you have working for you, about the people that you're engaging with, and it's they're your biggest asset, and they're also your biggest source of pain and suffering so having the right group of people on your team is very important and getting rid of bad apples is huge so I'll say that a little off subject but it's important in business because when you're regrouping for whatever reason you are taking to regroup a lot of times it reflects around people so and I have many times made a mistake of keeping somebody on my team that shouldn't have been there, my instincts and my gut swirling around saying, you know, you got to do something about this. And then I let other people talk me out of uh, partners and so forth, talk me out of not doing what was necessary and uh, come to find out ever however much time went on before they finally, uh, things changed, they were let go or so forth. They moved on and everything, things were better. 
was the fact that I knew that back in the beginning that should have taken place. And it would be great <laughs> to if I had done it back then as opposed to carrying the pain and suffering that went on along with having the wrong person on the team. You know, so it's, it's a couple things when it comes to people. And that is you either coach them up or you push them out. Okay, very important, very, very important is to, if you cannot coach somebody up, then there is a excellent, excellent opportunity for them somewhere else that fits them, fits their strengths, fits their personality, and it, you're helping them to go find that place that's going to be better for them. So uh, uh, other things when it comes to uh, doing some type of step back. I have many times with my uh, the partners. I don't have partners in my software company anymore. It's, it's just me. But in the times in the past when I did have partners, it would be like, okay, you know, things are off. We got to go talk. So we go have lunch together and we do the powwow or we would go sit in a conference room for a while with the door shut and, and zero in. Okay, hey, this, what's going on here? What do we do about it? Let's kind of get this out there. Let's talk about it. Let's uh, brainstorm together and do a reset with that. Um, there's other the other ways that reset kind of can happen normally within a business is the way you approach your rhythm. What's your rhythm? Um, do you do a daily huddle or meeting? Do you do a weekly meeting? Do you do a quarterly planning session? Do you do an annual planning session? And all those things lead from one to the other. And I had that type of rhythm when I had a lot of people in the US here, I had you know, 10 people in the US and I had 50 people in India for the software company. And with that, um, we would have an offsite meeting every quarter where we would plan our quarterly goals. And that was a reset for us. We would be at, at, in the mountains or in a, in, a, in a location that was away from the office, away from the distractions, and we would all sit and figure out what are the pains in our business, what are our goals for the next uh, next three to five, the next year, and the next quarter? And are we on track to get to those goals? And what are we going to do this quarter to keep us going towards those that that future that we want to see for the company? So they would be uh, definitely a um, a reset that would be part of uh, what I think you're talking about. And I've reset in the sense of you know changing directions and doing things where things weren't going really well financially. It could be tough. Uh, people could be tough and things just change either through own self uh, will or through uh, the fact that you can't go anywhere else so they have to change and that would create a reset and so sometimes um, and they were for the best a lot of times I'm dealing with pain and suffering going at a certain at a certain point right now and the reset would have to take place and when it did it, it, it caused a world that was much better a much better future than it would have been if it uh, stuck in that same place. So anyway, different ways to look at a reset, different opportunities that can be used to help deal with a reset, uh, just getting away from things, uh, taking a walk, as, as I was talking before, and doing the um, a few days at the beach has been a great reset for me. I would travel a lot for business. And I would always try to incorporate a few extra days wherever I was, especially when it was a beach place or maybe a ski place. And those few days would allow my mind. I actually did the best thinking on airplanes and at, um, at different places out of the office. So I would consider that a reset, too. I would come back with fresh ideas and a new approach, a little bit new energy to my business when I was able to get away and be not part of the whole um minutia of, of distractions and, and the ongoing problems that are surrounding me and get out and, and have a little bit fresh face. And maybe it was that putting the feet in the sand and getting that taken care of some of that uh, just start, um, charging you know, some of that negative energy and moving forward in a way that allowed me to open up to a fresher, a fresher uh, place and, and, and a, a better future. So hopefully that answers your question. Robin and look forward to any feedback that you have um, uh, relative to that. So that's all the questions I have right now. I look forward to sharing more in the future. I look forward to your questions. It's uh, uh, what you have here is really special and I want to emphasize that. As I said before, I've been an EO for 20 years now and my peer group of being there and bouncing ideas off of and getting their experiences has been 
invaluable to me and and i wouldn't change that and probably i would consider that the single best decision i've made um, as far as organizational and so forth in my business world was to be a part of a peer group that i can learn and grow with and they've exposed me to the the, the road, getting rid of roadblocks and opening up to the book right books to the right speakers to networking with the right people and so this type of group accelerators organization is very valuable and it'll help you get to the next level so i emphasize that utilize it we say in eo all the time is you get out of it what you put into it okay so you have to go out you have to watch the mentors you have to ask the questions and when you do you will be rewarded with that amount of experience share that can help you and help you get to the next level help you in life in general personally um, and also professionally and maybe even spiritually. So good luck, everybody. And until next time, all the best.